our final podcast of the Trump presidency, the next time. First, first Trump well, term. Well, first term of the Trump presidency. Yes. Trump term. <laughs> See you guys We'll meet back here in 2025. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, well, maybe I'm not. Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. We were off for MLK Day yesterday. I hope everyone had a good, meaningful, long weekend. Today is the final full day of Donald Trump's presidency. It's also almost five years to the day that we began this podcast, January 22nd, 2016. And during that time, we've covered two presidential elections, a midterm cycle, two impeachments, and countless scandals. It's been a period of political news dominated by a single individual more than any time I can remember. And tomorrow, his term ends. So today, we're going to reflect on Trump's presidency, how he changed politics, and what lasting effects he'll have. To do that, we're going to use the outline that Nate wrote back in 2017, two weeks after Trump was inaugurated. It's called 14 versions of Trump's presidency from hashtag MAGA to impeachment. And it lays out the different paths the last four years might have taken. Longtime listeners will remember that we've reflected on these paths a few times during Trump's time in office. So we'll look back at it now that it's all on the history books. Later in the show, we're also going to broaden out beyond that outline and talk about Trump's legacy going forward. And here with me to do that is Editor-in-Chief Nate Silver. Hey, Nate. Hey, Galen. Um, happy birthday, by the way. You were off last week for a pretty uh, significant week in the, the Trump presidency, but I hope you got it did some not It did not feel like I was for your off, birthday. but uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, also here with us is Managing Editor Micah Cohen. Hey, Micah. Hey, Galen. Hey, everybody. And also here with us is our colleague from ABC News, White House correspondent Karen Travers. Hey, Karen. Hey, Galen. Thanks for having me on. It's great to have you. Uh, Karen and I have talked plenty on ABC News Radio, although this is your first time on the podcast, so uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And Perry is out today. So I am going to kick us off by just quickly reading the 14 paths that Nate laid out uh, two weeks after Trump's inauguration in 2017. And I'm curious to hear which are most reflective of what actually happened. And as I'm going, you guys can shout out and say, like, let's come back to that one or like definitely or not at all. Um, and then and, and then we'll dig deeper into each of them. So the first category is called Group One Extrapolations from the Status Quo. And the first one is Trump keeps on Trumping and the country remains evenly divided. Two, Trump gradually or not so gradually enters a death spiral. Three, Trump keeps rewriting the political rules and gradually becomes more popular. So that's group one, and that has to do with his approval rating in general. Group two is Trump changes direction. So option four, Trump mellows out slightly. Five, Trump cedes authority. Six, Trump successfully pivots to the populist center, but with plenty of authoritarianism too. Seven, Trump flails around aimlessly after an unsuccessful attempt to pivot. So that kind of had to do with policy there. Group three are the three horsemen of the presidential apocalypse, war, recession, and scandal. So eight is Trump is consumed by scandal. That seems self-evident. Nine, Trump is undermined by a failure to deliver jobs. Ten, Trump's law and order agenda is bolstered by an international incident or terrorist attack. Then group four is things fall apart. And 11 is... Trump plunges America into outright authoritarianism. 12, resistance to Trump from elsewhere in the government undermines his authority, but prompts a constitutional crisis. And then the final group, group five, is Trump makes America great again. So the two options here are 13, Trump becomes Governor Schwarzenegger. 14, Trump's button mashing works because the system really is broken. So there's a lot there. Nate, kick us off, reflecting on all of these 14 versions of what might have been, which do you think is the most accurate now? Well, given that we had 14 choices, you would hope that we had one that nailed it, and I don't think any of these did, frankly. Um, 
you know, I mean, look, um, there are a few things I think we can say. One is that I do think that if you look at the events that happened in 2017 and the most significant things, and there were significant things, there was Charlottesville, right? There was um, immigration policy, but things definitely did, I think, spiral more and more out of control in each year of the term. Um, when we wrote that piece, it was kind of about, oh, what would this do to Trump's approval rating? Kind of thinking more narrowly politically as opposed to, you know, but the fact that the Trump presidency ends with a COVID pandemic that's killed hundreds of thousands of Americans and where response has been among the worst in the world and with an insurrection at the Capitol, um, you know, I mean, it certainly thing, feels like things spiraled a bit. Um, and he does, and, you know, he currently has like the highest disapproval rating of his presidency. If you are looking at that narrowly politically, they lost this race in Georgia, um, which seems like ages ago, but was only two weeks ago, right? The spirals out of control theme seems important. And I think it's partly because after four years, the damage builds, fewer and fewer, frankly, sane and competent people are willing to work for Trump. There are fewer holdovers in the previous administrations. People grow fatigued. So that rings kind of true, I think. And then kind of the ones about like the tension between plunging into authoritarianism on the one hand and kind of deep state resistance <laughs> on the other hand, right? I mean, this requires an assessment that I think is a little hard to make right now, which is how close do we get to things getting even worse, right? Um, I think on the question of like the Capitol Hill mob, um, things could very easily have been much worse where public officials were killed, um, you know, maybe minutes away from that happening potentially. How close did Trump come to kind of successfully trying to steal an election? I think it's a lot more ambiguous because people who were in a position of power and authority um, mostly avoided doing his bidding. In fact, almost uniformly avoided doing his bidding. Um, but yeah, I mean, it feels like things were um, stretched to the to the brink here. Yeah. Karen, weigh in here. You've been covering this White House now for four years. Yeah, I like number four. Uh, it was in group two, which was the headline, Trump mellows out slightly. And I think that's an interesting point to look at as we close out the Trump administration, because there was so much talk going into January 20th, 2017, that Washington would change Donald Trump, that, you know, he'd get here and realize that in order to get anything done, you have to work within the system. And he didn't know the system. He prided himself on being outside of the system. And, and he wanted to blow up the system. But, you know, the, the old people in Washington, you know, experienced people who dismissed him during 2015 and 2016 were telling us, yeah, but he'll figure it out that, you know, if you want to get legislation passed, you got to do it this certain way. If you want to uh, have media coverage, you got to do it a certain way. Donald Trump never did anything except the way he wanted to do it. His style never changed. And I think what was so interesting to see over four years was how Washington changed around Donald Donald Trump, that lawmakers, uh, Republicans and Democrats adjusted to his style and his way of governing through tweets, through, uh, you know, the uh, rapid fire Q&As he would do where he would announce policy in the middle of an answer to something and really be able to, you know, throw the shiny object over there and make everybody in Washington scramble. So much of this presidency was defined by his personality and that he governed by personality, by sheer force sometimes. And I think that's interesting interesting to think about the idea that maybe he could have changed. Maybe he could have mellowed out if things weren't working to his benefit. He never did. There were so many times we'd be told, well, this time he's learned his lesson. And this time he'll change the way he said that. And this next press conference will be when he takes responsibility. And, you know, here we are now, uh, two weeks after the insurrection at the Capitol, which he did not take responsibility for or show any remorse for, I think that's a clear sign right there, underlined how he's not going to do it the way everybody's telling him it has to be done. M maybe the pivot will come, you know, after he's done with his presidency. <laughs> we yes. still got 12 or 24 hours for the pivot. 
Yeah. Yes, that the <laughs> press conference else. he'll do on the way out the door where he says, you know, you're right, I should have done it this way, and I really should have listened to my advisors. And that's an interesting thing, too, that the big theme over the last four years has been, uh, you know, the number of people who would tell us, well, I told him we should do it like this, and we advised him to do this, but he blew up the playbook. You know, he always did that, but I'm not sure how much of a playbook there actually was. Because if you worked for Donald Trump, you went in knowing that handing him a playbook was not going to change his mind or change who he was. Wait, so this gets at uh, like a tension within these 14 paths that I'm curious to hear what you all think about. So um, in group one, talking about the president's approval, mostly the politics, there are two possibilities that Nate describes. One is Trump keeps on trumping and the country remains evenly divided, or Trump gradually or not so gradually enters a death spiral. Which of those two are more reflective of what actually happened? Because to your point, Karen, Trump just kept on Trumping, but his approval rating like didn't change all that much. So while it may seem like the political establishment, the administration around him, the events that the country was experiencing were in kind of a death spiral, did the country just remain evenly divided this whole time? It's tricky. I think one thing that um, that piece doesn't appreciate it doesn't appreciate enough, even though we often write about it elsewhere, is like the fact that you have um, these advantages to the GOP and the Electoral College in the Senate to some extent with gerrymandering in the House, right? That's important here because like Trump is not very popular. He's not catastrophically unpopular, but you can be pretty unpopular and kind of the country isn't evenly divided. More people are against Trump, but it winds up in the electoral system producing Republican wins half the time or so, right? Um, so that's an important distinction I would make. But yeah, obviously kind of the thing that looms over everything here is the very high degree of partisanship, even something um, as extreme as Trump inciting <laughs> an insurrection at the Capitol. That does have an effect, but it, you know, shifts him from 41% to 37 or something. It's not enormous, right? I mean, partisanship is the overlay to to all of this. And the fact that it took an insurrection at the Capitol to do that slight drop. You know, the number of times over four years that we've all analyzed, like, well, this will be the thing that ends up dropping his approval rating even more. And this will be the thing that caused this massive exodus among his even, you know, diehard supporters or certainly Republicans on Capitol Hill. We never saw that. I mean, through controversy after controversy, it didn't happen until the final days of his presidency. You know, even up until January 5th, all of the repeated conspiracies and baseless claims about a stolen election, Republicans on Capitol Hill just kind of ignored it, if not agreeing with him. And he kept that hold on his base and his supporters. January 6th, I think, changes everything. So if you're going to talk about a death spiral, it wasn't uh, gradual. It, it happened in the last 14 days. Yeah, yeah and e even then, right, most Republicans on Capitol Hill stuck by him, right? Um, still voted uh, to object to the certification of the election results. Um, and Trump's approval rating has fallen, but but not, you know, it hasn't bottomed out in the way that Nixon's did, for example. I mean, that that is a disconnect between be, that you see in all of these, right? A little a little bit of most of these are true, but there's a disconnect, which is, I think, what you were getting at, Galen, between um, I think the politics, which are which are constrained by partisanship, and and the actual world, which which in many ways the more extreme scenarios here, where Trump does a a ton of damage, and which you know which stuff I think would would have been hard to imagine at least to specifically like an insurrection at the Capitol. The more extreme scenarios in terms of the real world, I think I think happened. They just didn't you know, um, produce the sort of uh, proportional response in terms of politics, right? Now, I want to, I do want to be a little careful though, because like the political system is still responsive enough that Trump was soundly defeated, um, but it's just not that responsive or as responsive as it used to be because of these kind of systemic structures that favor Trump and Republicans.
So does that get at path three, which is Trump keeps rewriting the political rules and gradually becomes more popular? So, of course, he didn't gradually become more popular. But did he rewrite the political rules or is he sui generis? Like once Trump is out of office, the same rules apply. It's just that Trump was such an anomaly that he could kind of act uh, very, very differently from other presidents but not end up with like a 25% approval rating like Bush did at the end of his presidency. And, and if you read this path in Nate's piece, a lot of it gets at Overton window shifting, which is that like he shifts the Overton window so much in his direction that things that might have seemed extreme once upon a time no longer seem extreme. I don't think I, I don't think Trump rewrote rules, did he? What rule did he rewrite? I think we learn things through the Trump era about the way politics works. You know, I think in the in the Republican primary in 2016, for example, maybe we'll get into this more later, but, you know, we learned or I learned that, um, oh, actually, conservative policy doesn't really matter much to, you know, fidelity to conservative policy doesn't matter much to most Republican voters and, and that, um, you know, racial animus, which we knew was an animating factor, was was the much bigger animating factor in 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 Republican primaries and in Republican politics. And then I think we learned um, in the Trump during the Trump his actual term in office that racial animus, that part of things, um, plus partisanship. Uh, is also more of an animating force than like fidelity to small d democratic values and to um, those kind of norms. So like, I think Trump revealed things that more starkly revealed things that were already true. Um, But I don't think he rewrote any rules, did he? Yeah, I think maybe just for himself. I don't think for politics in general. I think one thing that's interesting is that you look at, you know, the background that Donald Trump came to Washington with. You know, he was a real estate mogul. Uh, he was a, you know, this created personality, the TV personality that people came to know. And that is so unique from all of the other people in Washington who are trying to be like Donald Trump. You know, we watched so many Republican lawmakers try to follow that Trump model and tweet something outrageous or, you know, give an insult. Like remember Marco Rubio trying that during the Republican primary in 2015. And it just doesn't work for anybody else. And once he leaves town, it's going to be interesting to see how many of them still tried to fashion themselves as the heir to the Trump uh, supporters and the MAGA legacy, because they can't do it just like Donald Trump did it because of just who he was and how he created this personality, cult of personality around himself. You know, I think that it's it's going to be interesting now to see who tries to out Trump Trump once he's gone. And I don't think anybody can come close to doing that. So if he rewrote any rules, nobody's going to be able to stick to them or follow them. They were rules he made for himself. You know, he, he rewrote the playbook for himself uh, when he came into Washington. Yeah. And to add to that, actually, we've seen both national polling and polling of Republicans in particular come out uh, after January 6th on Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz. And neither of them are, are, they're not definitely not popular with Americans, but they're not even particularly popular with Republicans. And so to your point, the people who kind of have fashioned themselves a little bit as the heir to Trump supporters don't really seem to be all that popular because while they may have taken notes on the kind of anti-democratic ways of Trump or the brashness, they haven't, they aren't Donald Trump himself. Um, but I'm curious, Nate, how, how are you thinking about the extent to which Trump did or did not refashion the rules in politics? Yeah, I, I don't I think he tried and, it, and the rules proved pretty robust. Right. In terms of like, I mean, they he lost badly at the 2018 midterms, although added seats in the Senate. But the House was a pretty devastating result for Trump. And he lost reelection, which is unusual for an elected incumbent president to lose reelection. Um, so there were prices to pay. Did Trump rewrite the rules of winning primaries, I think, is a question one can ask. Um, But given that Joe Biden, four years later, and the next data that we have, won the primary in kind of a very traditional, in some sense, way, where he built a coalition, got a lot of support from the party establishment, um, built momentum after Iowa. I guess overall, I'm inclined to view Trump's nomination as less of a fluke than I think I did four years ago. 
that the things he represents are more are more fundamental to the Republican Party than um, than I thought at the time, right? Including authoritarianism, including white supremacy, including violent traditions within populism, if you want to call it that. Um, at the same time, if you do look back on five years ago now, I guess, right? Um, Trump also kind of fooled a lot of people into thinking he was kind of like a moderate Northeastern deal maker that was brash and bold, right? And a little impulsive, but, you know, there were people who said, we want to nominate Trump and not Ted Cruz because Ted Cruz is too conservative and will scare off independent voters, right? But they'll like Trump. You, I mean, that wasn't the only thing people were saying, but, like, it was kind of complicated. And Trump has his background as, like, an entertainer and stuff like that, too. Are the political rules different for the two parties in the sense that Democrats do seem very focused on campaigning to the median voter, and that's how they were successful. But President Trump was always focused on his base. He was focused on his base in the primary. He was focused on his base largely in the general election in 2016 and for most of his presidency. Can Democrats do the same and still win elections? Or is this a rule that kind of applies more to Republicans? I think it applies more to Republicans just because of the structural advantages they have, right? Um, I mean, a Republican has won the popular vote for the presidency, what, one time in the last 20-something years, right? Um, so between the Electoral College and the Senate, there are structural uh, there are structural forces that skew the popular will in the favor of the Republican Party, which allow the Republican Party to win elections with minority support, support right? With with forty five percent of the vote, or something like that, right? Now. As we saw with Trump, they can't win it with with 40 percent um, or, or closer to that. But I do think Democrats, just frankly, because the voters are are more inefficiently distributed throughout the country because of efforts by Republicans to suppress the vote. I don't think Democrats can do that base play as easily as Republicans can be because of that difference. Also, just like, look, like re the Republican Party has shown a, a nihilistic streak that we haven't seen from the Democratic Party yet. I'm not sure if like given the opportunity, more Democrats would maybe they would show that streak. But but we've only we've seen it concentrated predominantly in one party so far. So it's like it's two questions. It's can you can you get away with like not playing by a rule and are you willing to to not play by a rule right yeah i mean i i still think um that trump wasn't served well by this instinct to always play to his base right i think there are many paths where trump wins re-election to bring back to the paths um even with the COVID pandemic and stuff like that um i think the fact that like you can do okay with just your base. You can win certainly Senate seats in lots of red states, which are a lot of states. You can, you know, kind of keep your approval rating at 40% instead of falling to 20 or something, right? The fact that, like, you can kind of limp along um, and you have this high floor may have made it a more appealing prospect than the fact that, hey, if you get all the, the base plus just a little bit of the swing voters, right, if you don't lose independence by 17 points, whatever he did to Joe Biden in the exit poll, um, then you could have had a second term. And so um, so I think that instinct did not serve him well. And I think it was kind of like a mislearned lesson in the GOP primary where in a multi-way race, then having 40% is huge. In a two-way race, 40% will, even with your electoral college advantage, get you kicked out of office. 
I don't know if this might answer some of that, Galen, but, you know, to kind of bring it to the real world of what was happening at the White House, you know, one of the biggest jokes in Washington, I mean, a lame joke, but it was infrastructure week. You know, every week was going to be infrastructure week. And this is the week that they're going to talk about nuts and bolts things and getting dollars out to cities and states and, you know, hiring people to get to work. And it never happened. But that became kind of emblematic of the larger, I think, uh, a big failure of the Trump administration. The White House, we'll say specifically the White House team. You know, the president himself wanted to win re-election by uh, keeping every single vote from 2016 and figuring out a way to depress turnout on the other side or run against somebody like Bernie Sanders and that that would keep people home and that he just wanted to keep the same uh, plan as 2016. And obviously you can't do that with how things ended up in 2020. But if you look at what they did over the four years, there were so many missed opportunities where, you know, they would actually have have something that they could tout. And there's this one example we would always come back to. There was a, um, a bill that had billions of dollars that Congress renewed, the president signed, that was going to give money to do job training programs. So, you know, if you were a carpenter, you could go and t- get some of these grant money and take some courses and learn a new skill set. And Ivanka Trump was really heavily involved in this. She did a couple of events where she was touting this out on the road. She did an event the week before the president signed it with him. And he was kind of joking that maybe he would veto it, like kind of ribbing her a little bit. And she was like, you can't veto this. We just worked so hard on this. He ended up signing it behind closed doors. We didn't see it. There was no event. They didn't do any rollout for it. You know, a minor thing in the grand scheme of all of the controversy and chaos of the Trump administration. But that to us right there was an example of when they had something good to tout that maybe would have somebody out there, you know, the suburban woman who's just like, ah, I hate the tweets. I hate everything and the firings and all of this. That gets a lot of mileage on local news. That gets mileage in the local papers. And they never took advantage of some of the things that they could do like that that might have helped him expand just a little bit beyond that base. And, and some of that gets back to what I was saying earlier. You know, they would write a playbook for him and, and he would toss it. Instead, it just sort of forced us all to cover all of the controversy because that's what he was tweeting all day. To what extent did he actually pass the policies that he talked so much about in 2016 during his term? Because it, so path seven is Trump fails around aimlessly after an unsuccessful attempt to pivot. Now, of course, he didn't attempt to pivot. But how much of his agenda did he actually achieve versus this kind of flailing around aimlessly that you described, like when it comes to the wall, when it comes to immigration, when it comes to uh, trade uh, or, you know, offshoring, things like that? Like, Did he actually kind of pass all the things? Did he get accomplished the things that he said he would in 2016? I mean, the big items, you know, uh, repealing and replacing Obamacare, no. Uh, You know, Mexico paying for the wall, no. Uh, But, you know, the things that they will say are their biggest achievements, the tax cut bill, the tax bill in 2017, uh, the trade deals that they did, the new NAFTA with Canada and Mexico, and criminal justice reform. Those weren't the biggest things that he talked about on the campaign trail, for sure, but those are the things that they could point to as successes. But I think so many of the things that that you could say, uh, when there was a success in terms terms of some trade deals, he started a trade war with China, you know, and then there were all these other things that would happen that would negate or dilute what you could tout as an actual accomplishment. Uh, You know, we've been working on so many of these legacy pieces over the past couple of weeks, and you kind of go through your outline and you realize, wow, so much of this is controversy. Let's get back into the actual stuff that was happening up on Capitol Hill. He had a Republican Congress for those first two years, and, and really, I think they didn't come away with enough that they can say, we took a good advantage of having that Republican controlled White House and Senate and House, and actually something to show for it. From the like political side of all of this, so there's the there's a lot of the like culture wars and campaigning constantly uh, on Twitter and things like that that Trump did, and and then there's the actual policy. Nate and Micah, I'm curious, like Karen described a situation in which there were some training programs that you know Trump could have talked about more or whatever. Do Americans kind of care a lot about that the nuts and bolts of policy and like? jobs programs and things like that? Or are they more motivated by the culture wars? I think it's the culture wars, right? I mean, I was just thinking about this of like, okay, what what, what was the Trump administration most successful in doing? And like, okay, you could say um, 
kind of remaking the federal judiciary, right? Um, that was a big one. But maybe their 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 biggest success, quote unquote, it was was from their point of view the mainstreaming of this kind of white identity politics, right? That's the that's the biggest through line in all of Trump's actions and and statements and tweets and policies, right? Um, is this kind of white grievance, white identity politics, and and it's why the the storming of the Capitol felt so much like a like a inevitable culmination, as shocking as it was, right? Um, so the, the the kind of mainstreaming of of that um, is maybe the most lasting legacy. One, why do you call that a success? Well, because I think that's what they were trying to do. Um, I think it's, it's, you know, Perry wrote a piece for the site after, after in 2017, after Charlottesville, that was about this kind of white identity politics and the kind of put it, putting these groups, um, you know, white people, um, more religious people, people who, who historically have had every advantage in this country and trying to flip it and say, no, actually, the, this is now the marginalized um, part of America. These are the victims, right? Um, I, I think understanding the Trump administration through that lens is sort of the best, it's like the best unified theory of the Trump administration, right? If you were trying to make sense of like, why is the Trump administration doing any particular thing on any particular day? You know, there's a lot of days where you're just like, I don't, I have no idea. Um, but the best theory is, I think, this kind of white supremacy, white identity politics. It 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 fits so much of, of what happened, right? Yeah, I mean, and there's also some reporting that Trump, when watching the events unfold then. One six was sort of pleased with what he was seeing. I mean, he <laughs> they kind of did what he encouraged them to do. So why wouldn't he be pleased? I suppose. I mean, how much do you guys feel like that one six will be kind of very central to Trump's legacy because it's so recent? Is that dominating our thinking, or will that be kind of one of the immediate things people always think of when they think about Trump? I think it'll be one of the more immediate things, I think, because it's, you know, it's the final act on the way out the door. And that's what people yeah. remember. You know, it's hard to remember the 17th play of the second quarter, but everybody remembers, you know, dropping the ball in the end zone <laughs> as the buzzer goes out. You know, it's so I think this is going to absolutely define so much of his presidency, if not his entire legacy. And, you know, we look back at his inauguration speech and, you know, about the end of American carnage uh, and, and just the striking bookend to how then the administration ends. Uh, at the exact same location where he said those words too. Uh, you know, and I think that as we get further away from it too, you know, even just day by day, we're learning so much more about what happened. And Americans' minds are very, uh, memories are short-lived. You know, I think having, I, every morning for ABC Radio, I talk to stations all across the country. I spend three hours just talking to anchors and taking questions. And it's amazing how over the last four years, something that is a massive controversy on Monday is not even on the radar by Wednesday. It's completely forgotten by Friday because we've already had 10 more controversies. But this one is going to stick. This is different. And it, because of the president's own role in what happened, had he not uh, you know, done the rally, if, if people were just coming to Washington on their own, that's different. But he was so intricately involved in what happened. Um, you know, and I think... Uh, it's also notable, uh, not, I will not take credit for thinking of this, a smart Republican I was talking to last week was saying, just imagine what could have been after November 3rd if the president just accepted the reality that he did not win the election, which had been clear to all of us and people around him uh, and most of the country from November 4th on, that if he acknowledged that and moved on and tried to use that lame duck period to cram through some last minute things that he could do uh, and tried to focus on a reflection back on the last four years. Now, that would require him to be completely different than he had been in the previous four years. But, you know, maybe they wouldn't have lost the Georgia Senate 
Senate races. Maybe they could have kept the majority in the Senate. I mean, so many things would have been different uh, had the president not chosen to take the, the, the plan, which he had been laying the breadcrumbs for for months leading up to November 3rd, that he was never going to accept the election results and, and would challenge it and, and deny Joe Biden's legitimacy. But, you know, talk about a missed opportunity then that culminates in what happened on January 6th. And I think for so many people, that bitter taste in their mouth, even people who voted for him, that's what's going to linger. And that's what people are going to remember. Yeah, he could have he could have gone off and said, well, you know, I came so close to winning again. Yeah, it's all the fault of the China virus. Not my term, obviously. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there and he could mildly complain about, of course, there's, you know, these votes are suspicious, but I must accept the result. And you could kind of go out and probably at least to his base kind of claimed to have been a success. But again, mm -hmm. like I think, I mean, look, Trump is not a great strategic mind, right? He is kind of like a, um, a friend of mine calls it like a kind of a reptilian intelligence, right? Where like you kind of perceive threats and react to them, but there's no real long-term strategy for how his life is going to be um, outside the white house. I mean, look, I, one of the things that's about like that's very difficult about processing like the more recent events is on the one hand, um, well, I hate saying like worse than we thought because that gets in a lot of questions about like kind of what did we think or what should we have thought, right? But like on the one hand, you have these very disturbing events that reveal that things like this are possible in the United States, right? Um, which maybe in my privilege or whatever, you don't think about enough, right? On the other hand, um, the fact that they're associated with this guy who's a loser and the fact that they play out in this way, you know, I think the fact that the Capitol Hill riot occurs will make at the margin elected officials a little bit less likely to deny the reality of election results. I think there'll still be plenty of it. Right. But I think you now have a clear tie in the minds of the GOP to this can turn violent. We'll still get lots of it. We might just have a tiny bit less than before. So, so I don't know. So I think we can maybe put aside the final category in the paths that you laid out, Nate, which is the, you know, Trump becomes Governor Schwarzenegger or that the button mashing works because the country really is broken. But the, the category right before that is that Trump plunges the country into outright authoritarianism. And, and then path 12, that there's a constitutional crisis. So we talked a little bit about, while he may have desired um, a more authoritarian-like outcome, that there were state-level Republicans and even Republicans in Congress and Mike Pence himself who prevented that from happening, the courts, of course, as well. Ultimately, did we end up facing a constitutional crisis during the Trump presidency? Does the... Second branch of government inciting an attack on the first branch count as a constitutional crisis? I guess like <laughs> it's not, not <laughs> it's, it's like it's, a, it's not it's a, a crisis. Is a constitutional? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not like a question that the Constitution can't resolve. It certainly felt like we had many crises during the Trump administration where where it felt like there was no remedy to it. Um, either the Julia Zari wrote a great piece for us that's like the different types of constitutional crises you can have. And one is like the Constitution just doesn't say what to do, right? Um, and so there's a crisis of like, okay, we don't know how to handle this, right? Um, the other is that the, there there is a constitutional remedy, but that there's not the political will to 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 use it. Um, and that one, I think it felt like there were a lot of moments during the Trump administration where where we had a constitutional crisis in that sense, that there was when, you know, there was just not the political will to to sort of follow the, the Constitution. I mean, what like what's an example? Um, Trump openly tried to get a foreign nation to interfere in a U.S. election Um you know, President Trump, you know, openly pressured um, and threatened a state official, Georgia, a Georgia state official to to help him overturn a legitimate election. Right. Um, 
you know, and I'm not even getting into like the the emolument stuff or the personal enrichment stuff or the corruption stuff, all of which is very serious and very well documented. That's the conversation we should be having, right? It's like what what and and that we have had, but like what what do you do when one party isn't acting in in good faith and what happens then? And what happens when you have a you know, again, Trump and Trumpism are not very popular. They're not that unpopular, but they're certainly far, far from any type of majority view. And like, but, you know, but in this case, a majority doesn't really have the sorts of power it might want to have. Right. And that underscores a lot of this, I think. I mean, certainly a pain about like how robust is like American constitutional democracy. Certainly a pain of that has to have fallen <laughs> over the past four years, right? Um, whether it's an acute crisis or not, I don't know. But like, what happens in four years if you have a Trumpist as a Georgia Secretary of State, right? Um, and Michigan doesn't certify these results, then you probably go to the court. I think it probably still winds up with a Biden presidency. But, you know, um, I don't know. Karen, you're you're there, mm-hmm. though. What is... is... Does this seem great? Like, uh, what do you think of this? I, I think one thing you would hear from Republicans who were very concerned about plunging into a constitutional crisis uh, was kind of a bit of a gallows humor that, you know, if they were better at this, then maybe we would have fallen off that cliff. But that the Trump administration, the president, as Nate was saying, you know, not a great strategist when it comes to some of this, the politics and the people around him, uh, you know, kind of fumbling on some of the big things. I mean, remember, one of the first big controversies of the Trump administration was the Muslim ban and how badly they rolled that out, that they kept having to go back and tweak it to get it to uh, be where they wanted it to to be and actually be allowed to move forward. And so much of that was because they just rushed it together that day, not talking to agencies as to how they figured out to actually implement what they were about to do. And that right there was, I think, shows you take that on smaller and bigger scales over the course of four years where so many things that they did that were uh, troubling to Republicans, that were worrisome on the constitutional question to Democrats. The reaction we would get from talking to people was, well, thank goodness they don't know what they're doing because this would be way worse if they came in very skilled at this uh, and had a, a very detailed plan to to push the country toward that. So, you know, there but the grace of God, I guess. Yeah, interesting. Um, I think I've heard that kind of gallows humor a lot, which is that, like, <laughs> if you had somebody with authoritarian tendencies who was less inept, like, they actually could have succeeded. Mm-hmm. Um And so I guess that's something to keep in mind going forward as we cover politics. I want to get off these 14 paths and just kind of broaden the conversation a little bit to what Trump's lasting legacy will be. Setting aside these 14 paths, because back in January 2017, there were a lot of things that Nate could not have predicted. The COVID-19 pandemic um, and other aspects of Trump's presidency. And now that all but one day of it is behind us. I just want to ask broadly what you believe Trump's legacy will be going forward, maybe that how that impacts the Republican Party, our politics more broadly, our our history books. Uh, Karen, let's begin with you. What is Trump's mm-hmm. legacy? Uh, you know, I think, eh, you know, we talked about this earlier, or are we thinking of it too much as to what just immediately happened? But I think the COVID pandemic and uh, the push to overturn the election results will be the two things that define the Trump presidency, because underneath that, you can get at every other aspect of how he governed, what they decided to do, his personality in office. You know, the COVID pandemic, uh, the the failure of the president to acknowledge the seriousness of it, to flat out lie to the the American people and downplay how bad it was and what would happen, you know, which we heard later in audio where he did an interview with Bob Woodward and, and admitting why he was doing that just does not scare people, that he had to be positive. I think uh, that will be uh, very telling about his approach to so many issues over the course of four years. And then I think the fact of uh, the not conceding the election, not uh, just not conceding, but pushing to overturn the results by pushing just 
baseless claims, flat out falsehoods uh, and that were based in uh, dark corners of the Internet, but then, you know, went mainstream through his pushing of them and him getting his tens of millions of supporters to believe it, which you see in the polls of how many people don't believe Joe Biden is the legitimate president. I think those two big crises and what the president did to uh, light the fire and fuel the flames for both of them, I think, will be the defining thing that we'll look back at. If you just want to throw out words to define the legacy, I think it will be uh, divisive, (laughs) unconventional, chaotic. uh, But his supporters stayed with him through all of that. And that's also an incredible legacy. He likes to say, I had more than 70 million votes, and that is nothing to scoff at, despite everything we've laid out of what happened over the last four years. Uh, He did get that number, and people are sticking by him. Yeah, I I would point to a few things. And I I think part of what I've been wrestling with is, like, on all these things, Trump is both a symptom and a cause and an accelerant, right? Um, But one legacy I think will just be the lying, as Karen was saying. I mean, from from the start of his campaign uh, to his last day in office um, on Wednesday, the amount of lying uh, was was stunning. And it was one of the most consistent, um, unending features of of Trump's presidency. Then also write the the some combination of like the exposure of how fragile our democracy was. So that's that's like more symptom and he just exposed it. But then also he helped it made it more fragile, right? Um by kind of uh upending these norms and and chipping away at at you know democracy. Um and then going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, the the for some people exposure um, and then the mainstreaming of this kind of white grievance, white supremacy, um, white identity politics slash right wing extremism. I think those three things are are really what I what I'd point to, I think, but the presidency is just ending. So it's, it's kind of hard to say. So if you consider that legacy from a political, you're the Republican party and you're thinking about Trump's legacy going forward and how it applies to the Republican party, you see that Trump won 74 million votes. He had like incredible turnout for Republicans. Also on top of that, you, you saw that he won the most diverse coalition uh, for Republicans, including voters of color, in his coalition in decades. Um, and so do you look at that and say there's certain things that Trump did that we need to replicate going forward? Or do you look at that and say, like, we really need to, like, a tabula rasa, start over with something completely new? <laughs> That's a t- I mean, I'd put it this way. I... I don't think the, if you talk to, you know, the very concerned Republicans, um, from their point of view, the parts of the Trump presidency that they hated the most, I tend to think those are not incidental to the benefits, again, from their point of view of Trump. Trump's you know, strongman tendencies, his racist rhetoric. I don't think you can view those things as just like incidental to the to the fervor of his following and support. Right. I think those two things are connected. So I'm not so sure if you're if you're a Republican politician who wants to move on from Trump, that you're going to have a super easy time, you know, with a getting a scalpel and kind of carving out the parts of of the Trump legacy that you don't like. I think it's all one big interconnected thing. Yeah, that's why I do get I mean, because you hear this thing a lot um, about like, yeah, what if Trump were slightly more competent, right? We've been talking about that here. But like, I think you can't just change one part without changing the whole, right? It's like the what I call the 
what if Steph Curry were six feet nine argument, right? <laughs> He'd be a very different player um, and maybe less skilled in certain important ways. And in any event, he's already kind of like a, you know, genetic five sigma, <laughs> you know, freak with his talent and his work ethic and whatever else, right? Um, and so, you know, most people don't ever become president. Um, and I think the kind of Trump imitators may wind up with the bad parts of Trump, like the more open racism, for example, but not like the talent. It feels weird to use that word, right? But like Trump has a certain type of talent. Um, Trump is, among other things, entertaining. Um, Josh Hawley is not. Tom Cotton certainly is not, right? Um, I don't think people are going to travel from outside state lines to hear those guys give a one hour speech, um, which may or may not matter in the end, but like, but yeah, I mean, look, I don't know. I mean, I, one question is what does like a Mitt Romney or a Lisa Murkowski kind of do? I mean, Lisa Murkowski at one point talked about leaving the Republican party, but then made clear that wouldn't mean she would become a Democrat. I'm not quite sure what that means exactly. Right. But like, um, you know, do we see some type of capital C conservative party form in the U S do we see more people running as independents? Those seem like salient questions that will kind of sort out and will be important in 2022. I think Twitter did uh, Republicans a big, big favor in the last couple of days by banning the president from social media, the, the platform. Because, you know, he, when he left Washington, so let's just go back to like a January 4th world where the, the idea of President Trump moving to Florida, toying with the idea of running for re-election, keeping all of the Republican hopefuls, the contenders for 2024, essentially held hostage as he considered running, even if he never does, but just teasing that for two plus years. And uh, doing that on Twitter and sending little jabs at Josh Hawley and jabs at Ted Cruz, maybe even Mike Pence, too. But he can't do that now. And, you know, the thing that Republicans hated so much over the last four years was being accosted in a hallway up at the Capitol and being asked, you know, did you see the tweet? What is your reaction to the tweet? And they just tried to figure out how to ignore it, to pretend they never read the tweet or try not to comment on it. It's going to be a lot easier for them to have that albatross of Trump Twitter taken off their necks because his ability to lob grenades from Mar-a-Lago and, you know, play around and puppet master a bit with the Republican lawmakers and presidential contenders is now severely limited. You know, he's going to have to have an event to do that. He's going to have to issue a statement over email, which, my God, that's so boring. That's not Donald Trump. Uh, and so I think he Twitter helped them all out a big deal because they can say we're moving on and we don't have to look around that like the monster is coming back, you know, around the corner. He's gone. He's not going to be tweeting. So it's a good thing for Republicans. It, which help which I, I think you're right Karen because like somebody I was listening to somebody make this point um, somewhere else so it's not my, my point but you know after the 2012 election remember there was like when Romney lost there was like this Republican autopsy um, and there was all this kind of self-reflection about wh- how, what do we need to change as a party to to win elections again Um None of that actually happened. Like none of the none of the steps recommended in that in that brief actually were taken. I don't think, or or not meaningfully. Um, I think part of the party took them seriously, but there were just uh, enough people and enough you know very enthusiastic campaigners. Yeah, that, the, to the primary to the people who show up in primaries. Like I don't think they really cared about the autopsy. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. But but you don't see any self-reflection right now do you i mean unless i'm like missing it I mean, yeah you do but like it's mostly people who want to enhance their careers post-trump like maybe worked in the trump presidency and are and are now talking about how they see the gop charting a path forward like Alyssa farah and people like that you know doing that kind of self-reflection it may be self-serving self-reflection um but I think there are Republicans talking about, you know, what we need to do going forward. Yeah, I'm talking about like party. Electoral. Right? Yeah, like party yeah. apparatus. Yeah. Parts of the party officially being like, what do we do here? And I don't think there's there's that. Yeah, maybe it'll happen. I'd be surprised. Yeah, like right? how like do we expand that diverse coalition? Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, they're keeping on the same page. But like you said, Galen, you know, about the diverse coalition that Trump put together, you know, another point of like, imagine if he talked about that for the last two months instead of talking about his conspiracy theories. Imagine if he was highlighting the gains they made among certain voting groups and, you know, to use that to propel them forward to 2024. That would help the Republican Party, but that doesn't help Donald Trump. So that's why we don't see him saying that. This is uh, maybe a little bit of... uh, a pivot from where we've been, but I think it's really important in thinking about Donald Trump's impact on our politics and where we go from here is tomorrow Joe Biden will take office. And while Trump certainly reshaped the Republican Party, he reshaped the Democratic Party too, um, just very much in the reactions to him as a person and the kinds of policies he enacted. I mean, just one polling example is you see that once Donald Trump entered the you know public sphere, started running for office. Democrats' views on immigration changed dramatically, so they were much more in favor of uh, you know immigration, much more likely to say that immigrants helped the country than they were before Trump became a political figure. What are the other ways that Trump has shaped the the Democratic Party during the past four or five years? I think he's made it more of the party of professionals um, and certainly less of the white working class and maybe at the margins still overwhelmingly the party of the black and Hispanic and Asian working class, but maybe a bit less than at least four years ago. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, we talked about the biggest kind of demographic shift in the Trump era is this much higher correlation now between education levels and party affiliation, which is also related um, to urbanization, right? Wealthy, well-educated people in cities are much more likely to be democratic than they were eight years ago. Um, rural white people are, are much less likely to be. And this keeps getting more extreme in every election. And it has lots of consequences for what the democratic agenda is. I mean, look, in some ways, Democrats come out of 2020 looking fairly good, right? They had this um, uh, relatively smooth nomination process once it was all said and done, where kind of Joe Biden wound up winning by a pretty comfortable margin, and he went on to win the presidency, and they went on to just barely capture the Senate. So even though they lost seats in the House, and the margins weren't as big as people thought, kind of, you know, somehow I think that events of the past few weeks, right, um, I don't think it any longer looks like, oh, Democrats kind of, they nearly came up short. They underperformed the point spread, right? I mean, it now kind of feels like they just barely, but they kind of held their shit together in historically challenging times. And maybe you shouldn't take very much of that for granted. Obviously, again, with the wins in Georgia, it's a lot easier to put an optimistic spin on on how the Democratic Party did in 2020. But Georgia's very meaningful. I think one maybe simplistic way that uh, Donald Trump shape the Democratic Party is that he gave them Donald Trump to rally around and that kept the party together because they had this one thing that they all agreed on. Because there are a lot of things that Democrats do not agree on. And some of those big, big differences between, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her wing of the party and the more moderate wing. And, you know, you can paper over a lot of that because you have to focus on getting Donald Trump out of office and winning in 2020 and, and trying to expand the majority, which, of course, we did not see happen. And I think when you take Donald Trump out of the equation, some of those uh, issues that have been bubbling below the surface for Democrats on Capitol Hill, I'm talking specifically about, you know, the lawmakers here um, that have been, you know, just pushed aside, they're going to come roaring back and, and they could potentially bubble over. And Nancy Pelosi has a very small majority right now. You, of course, have the 50-50 split in the Senate once the two uh, Georgia senators are seated. So it's going to be tight. You know, you can't uh, start angering even small factions of your caucus right now or else you're not going to get anything done. And they have to figure out how to thread those needles. And when you don't have Donald Trump as your boogeyman to blame everything on, you got to work harder than to keep everything together on your own team. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, because I think one way in which Trump changed the the Democratic Party is he he I think for a lot of Democrats um, lowered their tolerance for like caution, um, p- political caution. Right. 
Um, and I think you heard it during the Trump era. A lot of Democrats say, like, we can't, you know, be timid anymore, right? I, you, Democrats often criticize their own party for, like, um, you know, being bad at politics. Basically. Not being more Trumpian. <laughs> right. No, no, we're like not being more Trumpian or just like not being as as ruthless as the Republican Party. That's like a self-flattering critique in some way, right? If you're a Democrat. Um, but I do think you saw you saw more in a lot of parts of the party, more boldness um, during during the Trump era. To Karen's point, though, not in all parts of the party. And now they're going to have a moment where they have to kind of square that circle, right? Mm -hmm. Do you see these? So, you know, we've been talking over the past five years and over the past, you know, 10 years, kind of five years beyond that, we've seen very similar trends. The ones that Nate just described, which is, you know, professionals and, um, you know, voters of color, professional whites, voters of color, and then rural whites, non-college educated whites, kind of those two groups like separating off and creating different coalitions that have reshaped the suburbs and reshaped the cities and rural areas and reshaped the parties as a result. Do you think we're at the apex point of that trend? Or do you think that that is something that just continues on from here? I guess I'll put in my, my usual vote for mean reversion in the long run, you know? And we did have some mean reversion among non-white voters, right? Um, you know, I think Democrats might be concerned about that. Although, again, in the midterms, they did, or excuse me, in the Georgia runoffs, they got both very good turnout and very high vote shares from non-white voters in Georgia. So, you know, maybe there are people of all races who will turn out for Trump because he's a phenomenon and that kind of won't turn out um, for an ordinary Republican in the midterms. I mean, look, I think one thing too is like um, one effect of January 6th is that it's going to make, I think, Democrats and a lot of independents very scared of Republican rule for a long period of time. Um, and fear is often a motivator to get people to vote. And if on the right wing, you kind of see people downplaying the significance of um, of January 6th and downplaying the significance of Trump's, you know, claims about election fraud. I can see the Trump presidency kind of having semi-permanent effects of making Democratic turnout and political participation higher, whereas it may be more of a mixed bag for Republican participation if Trump himself is not on the ballot. Just to disagree, though, if Nate's going to going to go with mean reversion, I, I will guess that the that the trend continues and that we see we see the education split becoming even more pronounced. But that's just a guess, as I said. I my take would be that the suburban parts of the country remain pretty politically competitive and that it seems quite likely that, um, you know, quote unquote excesses of the Democratic Party could push those voters back towards the Republican Party. Um, so I guess I guess I might also be on uh, on the mean in the mean reversion crowd. Also, people keep saying that voters have short memories. I don't know if that's just like a saying now. Um, or if it's actually true. Um, but it, I wonder after January 6th, like how short term are voters' memories? I guess that's to be determined unless either of you have thoughts. <laughs> I mean, I do think that like the Wall Street Journal NBC poll asked people, how do you rate one six in the kind of, um, you know, historical legacy? You know, where's it rank in the, in the, is it like an all-time historic event for the United States? Is it pretty important, but not super important? Is it not that important, right? They also asked that question after September 11th and after kind of the start of the coronavirus pandemic, so to speak, in March, although it really started last December. Um, but when it kind of, you know what I mean? Um, and people rate it as being much less significant in those events. Um, and that might separate out the kind of, political class from from regular people on the street. Like, you know, I walked around New York City a bunch trying to collect my thoughts on January 6th. And there weren't like, there weren't like a ton of people like 
talking on the street about it. There were some, but it wasn't like September 11th when like everyone was only thinking about that, right? I think it's partly because like, um, you know, part of the story of 1-6 is what almost happened but but didn't happen, right? If Mike Pence or other elected officials have been harmed or killed, then I think every American would think this is a 9-11 style event, right? And we as journalists read other reporters and we know how close that could have been to happening, right? Um, but, you know, but we narrowly avoided a much bigger disaster. So, I don't know. All right. Well, let's leave things there. Um, our final podcast of the Trump presidency, the next time. First, first Trump well, term. Well, first term of the Trump presidency. Yes. Term. <laughs> See you guys we'll in We'll meet back here in 2025. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, well, maybe I'm not. But anyway, we the next time you will hear from us will be tomorrow after inauguration. We'll have a reaction podcast. We'll also have a live blog on 538.com. But that's it for now. So thank you, Nate, Micah, and Karen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. Claire Bidegary Curtis is on audio editing. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Bye.